Hello, my name is Lance Williams. Welcome to another session of Healing Journeys today. Are you in need of healing? Are you in need of physical healing for your body? I believe this message is for you then. We're going to talk about some foundational things in order for you to receive the healing that God has already provided. Now I want to encourage you, there's two books that I've read on the subject of healing that's really transformed my life. And one of them is Healing the Sick by T.L. Osborne. And the other is Christ the Healer by F.F. Bosworth. Again, that's Healing the Sick by T.L. Osborne and Christ the Healer by F.F. Bosworth. There's another good one uh, called Jesus the Healer by E.W. Kenyon. Jesus the Healer by E.W. Kenyon. All three of those books are great. But, uh, I, yeah, I would recommend reading all three of them. But really, uh, Healing the Sick and Christ the Healer have both really impacted my life. Uh, they've just transformed my life. And they're, they're such great works on, on the subject of healing. And so packed full of the Word. So I encourage you to read those or listen to them. They're free on YouTube to listen to, so I encourage you to get a hold of that material and, and check that out. So talking to you about some foundational things uh, concerning healing. The first point that I want to talk about is the necessity of steadfast, steadfast faith and knowledge of God's will. Because see, faith begins where the will of God is known. Faith begins where the will of God is known. You can't have faith for something if you don't know that God has already provided it. And see, that's why it's so important to understand the character and the nature of God. See, if you believe God is mean and He wants you sick and He wants you poor, then how are you going to believe for healing and prosperity? It's not going to work. But if you come to the understanding that God is a good God, that He desires for you to be healthy, wealthy, prosperous, now you can have faith for that. But see, we don't know God's thoughts on the matter until we get in the Word. How do you know who someone is? Well, first of all, you hear what they say. So you, you hear them and you experience their actions. And so God has given us His Word. This is His literal Word. And if we want to know who He is, it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So to get to know someone, we, we get to know them through their words. Well, it's the same with God. We get to know Him through His Word. Amen. And when we develop a relationship with the Word, then we start experiencing Him. Because, see, God, I believe, is working in our lives, but a lot of times we can't discern it. But once we start developing a relationship with the Word and we get to know who He is through the Word, we start discerning Him throughout the day, in day-to-day -day life. So we get to know Him through His Word. So we must know His will in a matter before we can have faith for that. So concerning healing... We must know what God says about healing before we can have faith for healing. So faith... See, faith for healing, it requires a knowledge. And it requires a knowledge of God's will. That's what it requires. Now God has already provided healing for you. It's already a done deal. But now when we acquire knowledge, wow, God says in His Word that He's forgiven all my iniquities, He's healed all my diseases, and other scriptures like that, now we understand, hey, God has provided healing for me, now I can exercise my faith and receive that healing. So the scriptures clarify God's intent for bodily healing. 
At the one I just mentioned was Psalm 103 uh, and Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 talks about how Jesus was our substitute, that our chastisement was upon him, that surely he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. And see, a lot of translations say griefs and sickness there, but if you look up the word in the original text, it literally means disease and pains. That's what it literally means. A matter of fact, I want you to go there right now. Let's read this. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Actually, I'm just going to start in verse... I want to start in verse 3. It says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But see, again, if you look up those words, sorrows and grief, it literally means, sorrows mean pain and grief means sickness. I'll tell you what, I'm reading this in the English Standard. Let's go read this in the Young's Literal Translation. I'm going to read this from the Young's Literal. I think Dr. Young did a great job at translating this. Verse 3 in the Young's Literal Translation, Isaiah 53 says, He is despised and left of men, a man of pains and acquainted with sickness. See, in other translations, it was griefs and sorrow. And as one hiding the face from us, he is despised and we esteemed him not. Surely, our sicknesses he hath borne. See, in the other translations, a lot of other ones, it's, um, it's translated, it's sickness and pains here is translated grief and sorrows. But Dr. Young, I believe, translated correctly here. It says, surely our sicknesses he has borne, and our pains he has carried them. And we... We have esteemed him plagued, smitten of God, and afflicted. And he is pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and by his bruise there is healing to us. By his bruise or his wounds there is healing to us. Verse 6, all of us like sheep have wandered each to his own way. We have turned, and Jehovah has caused to meet on him the punishment of us all. I want to ask you something. Where did sickness originate? When did sickness come into the world? Well, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, it said that the sin and death entered into the world. And see, sickness is a type of death. Because sickness, in every case, if not treated, if not cured, sickness leads to death. That's what it leads to, in every case. Every single time. Now you can say, well, that's not true, like the, the cold and stuff like that. I'm telling you, every sickness is designed to kill you. Now, there's just some that our, our, our body is able to fight off. But if our body doesn't fight it off, and there's no treatment or there's no cure, it leads to death. That's what it's designed to do. And so it that is a type of death. And so that death, sickness, came in through sin. So if Jesus has dealt with our sin, then at the same time, he's dealt with our sickness. In the book of Mark, I think it's chapter 2, they let the paralytic down from, from the ceiling because there was no room for them to get in otherwise. 
And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. So if this man's looking for healing, why would Jesus say your sins are forgiven? And then the religious folks that were being critical, they were saying, who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus said this, he said, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven? Or rise up, take your bed, and walk? Which, he said, which is easier? So he already told him his sins were forgiven. And then he said, he said, man, I tell you, pick up your bed and go home. And what he was saying in that, it, it's the same. Sickness is the fruit of sin. Now, I'm not saying that if you've got sickness in your body, I'm not saying that's direct result of a personal sin. Now, it could be, but not in all cases. But yet, we were all born into this world in sin. The scriptures say that David in the Psalms said, I was, he, he talks about how he was born into sin, that he was conceived in sin. And that's not talking about an immorality on the, the parents' part. It's just saying when we're born into this world, we're born into sin because of the fall in the garden. But Jesus, as our substitute, he's dealt with the sin issue, therefore he's dealt with the sickness issue. So it says here in verse 6, All of us, like sheep, have wandered each to his own way. And Jehovah has caused to meet on him the punishment of us all. So part of the punishment that entered in through sin was sickness. And it, it's been dealt with. Verse 7. It has been exacted and he has answered. And he opened not his mouth. As a lamb to the slaughter he has brought. And as a sheep before its shears is dumb. And he opened not his mouth. Go to verse 10. He says, and Jehovah has delighted to bruise him. This is talking about Jesus. And I want to remind you here, if you don't know, that these scriptures written here, they're written about Jesus. However, they were written 700 years before Jesus was ever born. 700 years. Yet this is clearly talking about Jesus. If you have any doubts that the Bible is God's Word, one thing that I would encourage you to do is look up the prophecies. No other book, no other religion has prophecies in detail like Christianity. There are prophecies in, in the Word of God and the Bible that were hundreds and thousands of years predicted, hundreds and thousands of years in advance. And specific prof prophecies, not just general prophecies. You know, like those fortune cookies you get. A lot of times that's just general statements, so it can include, you know, most people. But these are specific prophecies. Like just one that comes to mind, Jesus. It was prophesied that he would ride in on a donkey. <laughs> and he, he rode in on a donkey that wasn't even his. I mean, just... It's just, it's so powerful. But just the prophecies alone prove the, the divinity of God's Word, of the Bible. So these scriptures were written 700 years before Jesus. And yet it's prophesying about Him. Verse 10, And Jehovah has delighted to bruise Him. He has made Him sick. If His soul does make an offering for guilt, He sees Him. Seed, he prolongs days, and the pleasure of Jehovah is hand in his hand does prosper. So it says here that Jehovah, God Almighty, actually made Jesus sick. Now, why is that? Because of the substitute. He was our substitute. Jesus is our substitute. He went to the cross, and so all of our sin, all of our sickness. All of our disease, pain, infirmities, everything that has to do with the fall was laid upon him. It was transferred to him. In all of his life, 
his prosperity, his health. It was transferred to us. There was an exchange that happened. Our death and sin and sickness transferred to him. His life, health, peace, and blessing transferred to us. That's what happened at the cross of Calvary. Now we have been forgiven. As it says in Psalm 103, we've been forgiven of all of our sins. We've been healed of all of our diseases. Amen. And this scripture here in Isaiah, when it says, Surely our sicknesses he's borne and our pains he has carried them. Like I said in other scriptures, it, talk, it, it translates uh, sorrow and grief. But how about, we, how about we let the word interpret the word? So this scripture is interpreted in the New Testament. These exact scriptures. And let's go over there. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. In verse 17. It says that it might be fulfilled that was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The scriptures that we just read. Saying himself took our infirmities and the sicknesses he bore. Now this one is translated very well in most translations. I just read it in the Young's Literal, but let's look at it in the ESV. So even where the ESV translated griefs and sorrows over in Isaiah 53, here it says this was to fill, fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. The New King James says he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. See, this the scripture here, the New Testament, is interpreting what was being said in the Old Testament. And this is clearly talking about physical sickness, physical disease and infirmities. So it's clear right here. In 1 Peter 2.24 that talks about it himself. Uh, how's it worded? Himself who, who knew no sin. I'm trying to think how it worded it. I guess we could just go over there and read it. I used to have it memorized. 1 Peter 2.24 Himself bore our sins in His own body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. And here again it puts sin and sickness together. If you notice, he himself bore our sin. And then it says, by his wounds you have been healed. It's awesome because this puts healing in the past tense. And, and forgiveness of sins. He's, he himself bore, that's past tense. And you have been healed. You were healed, that's past tense. It's already been a done deal. But now when we have relationship, not just reading the scriptures once, but have an intimacy, a fellowship, a relationship with these scriptures by pondering on these scriptures, speaking out these scriptures, focusing on these scriptures of what the Bible says about physical healing. Then we have a knowledge of God's will in the matter, and now we're able to believe for the promise of God. We're able to have faith for what God has already provided for us. Amen. God's promises eliminate uncertain uncertainty. God's promises eliminate uncertainty and foster faith. But again, we have to have a knowledge of these promises. We we need to have an intimacy and a relationship with God's word. The promises of God reveal His eager intentions. God wants you to be well more than you want to be well. 
And I know many of you, you really desire to be well. And God wants it for you even more than that. But there's certain laws, just like there's natural laws, there's also spiritual laws. And God doesn't just suspend gravity because you jump off a building. There's just certain laws. Now, sometimes, yes, miraculous things can happen and laws can be suspended, but that's not the norm. That's the exception. It's the same thing in the kingdom. There's certain laws. There's laws of healing. And I'm still discovering those laws for myself. I mean, I know some of them, but still discovering more of her, more of them. But God doesn't just always suspend laws, but He wants you well, and He teaches us through His Word how to receive healing. And that's what we're talking about. So in order to, to really receive healing, you know, we've talked about that faith begins where the will of God is known. We have to understand what he promised on the matter, and we need to renew our mind according to that. And so I've already really touched on this, but it's more than just reading. See, Jesus said that if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. Then you are my disciples. Folks, we can be a disciple in one area and not the other area. If we're struggling in healing, we need to continue in healing. We need to continue in His Word. Have intimacy and fellowship with what His Scriptures say on healing. Continue in His Word and become a disciple. Discovering the truth, according to John chapter 8, verse 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But see, when the Bible talks about knowing something, when, he, when the Bible talks about Adam knew Eve, it wasn't just he had a knowledge of her. No, it was an intimacy there. An intimate relationship. And it's the same with the Word of God. By knowing the truth, it's not just reading it once. No, we need to have an intimacy, intimate relationship with the Word. We need to have a closest, closeness, a proximity to we need to literally have a relationship with the Word and what the Bible says on physical healing. And we shall know in intimacy, we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. And yes, that includes in our physical body. Amen. So renewing our mind, Romans 12, verse 2 says, Don't be conformed to this world. Don't be shaped into the image of this world. But be transformed. Be transformed. Don't So don't be conformed, yet be transformed like a caterpillar spins a cocoon and comes out a beautiful butterfly. It's a transformational process. And how do we do that? Through the renewing of our mind. Getting God's thoughts and thinking God's thoughts. But again, it comes through an intimacy with the Word of God. We must harmonize our mind with God's mind. He says that His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But He's given us His Word, is what He said. So He says in Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah chapter 55, says, my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. But the beauty is, is he's given us the word. He's given us his word. And through his word, we can begin to think his thoughts. We can begin to apply his ways to our life. That's the gospel. That's the beauty of God's word. Faith stems from knowing and acting on God's Word. See, faith without works is dead. And if we really believe, there's going to be a company action. And I love the way that Barry Bennett puts it. Because, you know, some people, they just, they, they try to act before they really believe. And Barry Bennett said it like this. He said, 
don't throw your pills away. Like, don't throw your medication away and know that you're healed. He said, know that you're healed and then throw your medication away. I'm going to say that again. He said, don't throw your medicine away and know that you're healed. He said, know that you're healed and then throw your medicine away. See, we must believe in our heart. And we need. it's important that we ask God, God, how can I act on my faith? How can I act on my faith? What do I need to do? Because, see, I got myself, I was getting myself in some trouble at one time. I had a bad ski wreck. Hit a tree doing almost 40 mile an hour. Broke my skull, face, ribs, severed my pelvis. My collarbone was like way up here outside of my shoulder. It wasn't like down in there anymore. And trying to act on faith which my heart was in a good place, but trying to act on faith, I mean, I was walking on my hip that was, the wing of it was totally severed. It was totally severed. It, the wing wasn't even attached anymore to the rest of my hip. And trying to be a man of faith, I was walking on it. I remember I pushed a, a van out of the snow on, on a broke pelvis. It was terrible. And then God's goodness and God's grace, and it's a really cool story how he did it, but I don't have time to share it right now, but he corrected me. And he led me to actually, it's, it's really cool how it worked out, but he led me to get my hip checked out again, and I, was, I found out, I actually went in to get my shoulder checked out, but they took a, examined my hip as well, and uh, said that because I was putting pressure on it, I was damaging my hip. I was actually, that bone was separating more and more. And after that, I was like, I went back on the crutches. And I'm like, God, I, how do I need to act on my faith? How do I need to believe for healing for my pelvis? And you know what God led me to do? He didn't leave me to walk on it, nothing like that. He led me to start declaring the word over myself. So what I would do, I would just consistently, actually every time I'd get in the shower, I remember the whole time I would just declare over myself, Jesus is my healer. Jesus is my healer. I would speak to my body, body, Jesus is your healer. Jesus is your healer. And I would just constantly say that throughout the day. And, and like I said, every time I would just, Every time I took a shower, I'd use that time and just declare that over myself. And see, that in that, God showed me how to act on my faith. And I kept doing that. And guess what? Five weeks later, my roommate walks in. And just in passing, it wasn't even anything like too I mean, serious in a way. Just in passing, <clears throat> he just kind of laid his hand on me and said, Praise God, you're healed. And I didn't think anything about it. Well, I crutched into my bedroom to, to get something. And all of a sudden, it just went off on the inside of me. I mean, it's like something came alive. And it's just like, I'm healed. I am healed. And see, I've been believing for healing. I'm believing I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. But in that moment, it's just like that seed. It just sprouted above ground. And all of a sudden, I went from believing I'm healed that I know that I'm healed. I know that my pelvis is healed right now. Now, it took me, I kind of play things out slowly sometimes. It's just, that's a safeguard for me. It took me two days to get a total peace about just throwing the crutches down. And part of that was was because of my previous experience from from trying to walk on it and stuff before I was ready to. But took me two days to get a total peace, but finally I just threw my crutches down, started walking, and I've been totally healed ever since. So, and I went back to the doctor, said hip strong and all that. I received miraculous healing on my pelvis. But see, I, now with my shoulder, I was asking God, God, what do I need to do about my shoulder? Because my collarbone was way up here. You know what God told me? God spoke to me and said, have the surgery. That's what he, and before the, before then, I used to wonder, does God really ever tell people to have surgery? Because, you know, I'd heard stories about that. But I was seeking to God. I was believing for healing for my shoulder. And he, he spoke to me and said, have the surgery. And actually, I, 
when he spoke to me about having the surgery, that's when I went to get checked on my shoulder. And that's actually when I found out I was doing damage to my hip. That's actually the story. And it's, and uh, I thought my hip was going to be fine and just needed my shoulder done. And he said, I had the surgery, went in. Doctor said, oh, we don't need to do anything about your shoulder, but, you know, we need to check out your pelvis. And then that's when they showed, told me I was doing damage. And then I'm like, okay, God, you told me to have the surgery. I found out I have, I'm damaging my hip, which thank you so much. That's, that's good to know. But I thought you said I needed surgery so I need it on my shoulder or my pelvis or what so anyway in that though I like I said I found out I was doing damn I gotta stop because time's sake but found out I was doing damage to my hip ended up going to get a second opinion on the shoulder and they said yeah your shoulder is 100% dislocated you you need surgery and so God again he told me to have the surgery so I I went to have surgery on my shoulder and I, I knew that's what I was supposed to do and see, my point is, is we can't just act out what we think. We need to ask God, seek God. God, how do I need to act on my faith? How can how can Joel, or not Joel, how can Jonah in the fish, how can he act on his faith? Well, do you know that it tells us? Do you know that there was an action with Jonah's faith when he was in the belly of a fish? But how, if you're sitting in the belly, how are you going to act on your faith? You can't really do anything. Yes, you can. The Bible says that he offered the sacrifice of thanksgiving. In that moment, God, God's way of acting on his faith was offering thanksgiving. And so he offered up the sacrifice of thanksgiving, started thanking God. And then, there was no signs at first, but then eventually the... Uh, after the sacrifice of Thanksgiving, the the well threw him up. Folks, I got to end because I'm 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 over time right now. But folks, let's seek God on how to act on our faith, and believe for Him to show you. So I'll continue talking about some of these things next week, and that's all I have for you. Again, we're just talking to you about some foundational things on those of you who need healing. And we all need to listen, because even if you don't need healing, you know someone who does. And in the future, uh, you, may, you may need to have an understanding of these things. So God bless you, and I will see you next week.